we present Raymond Graham Swing, Mutual's distinguished authority on foreign affairs, who will give you his analysis of the latest political and military news from Europe. Mr. Swing. Good evening. Now Hitler has made many decisive speeches in his day. He began making them before small groups of national socialists. His audiences grew and he came to address mass meetings. Then he found himself a rising political power and when he spoke, part of the German nation would listen. Finally, he talked himself into the position of chancellor and he addressed the whole people. Always he wove a spell when he spoke in Germany. Something about his word weaving defied analysis. Men and women who listened to him hit the sawdust trail to utter political conversion. And the more he spoke, the greater became the circle which was affected by his words. But Hitler's speeches have always been defiant, and their message has been exclusively to Germans, so that when his audience grew beyond the German frontier, they ceased making converts. They frightened people, they fed conflict, engendered deep antagonisms. Even so, Hitler's power, the power of his speech, continued to expand. Where he created antagonisms, he was still growing in power, the power to destroy. And so great has his power become that now, when he speaks, he addresses every part of the world that is affected by what happens in Europe. His is the strongest voice in a whole civilization. He is unique in history. No man has ever spoken who was heard by such multitudes and whose words might quickly change the destinies of such multitudes. A year ago, Hitler sent his voice across the face of the world during what we now call the Munich crisis. This year, more powerful than ever, he held over Western civilization the threat of European war. The war began, but when victory was in assured in Poland, Herr Hitler went to the microphone with a veiled message of peace, so veiled that it failed to impress the countries that had gone to war against him. And now he will come to the microphone again and more fully and more specifically discuss peace. It's not possible to say before the speech is made whether it brings a genuine offer at, of peace or a concealed offer of his own victory to be recognized by the Allies at no further cost to themselves and to him. But it is appropriate to say that this speech is bound to be a turning point in history, for if it does not make peace possible, the European war which has been held on the leash will break loose and bring all the ruination that the inventiveness and industry of man have contrived to make possible. In a sense, we're back in the crisis days, the days of August. A general war has begun, but it hasn't broken out. The swift thrust into Poland can count as only a gruesome curtain raiser to war. But it wasn't the general war. Now are pitted against each other the true forces at conflict. They seem poised to strike, but they haven't struck. Here and there a blow has fallen outside Poland. But the Allies are applying only the slow weapons of economic pressure and sea power, while Germany has deliberately stayed its hand, except to send out submarines and a few planes. This, then, is the moment when Europe can turn back. It is the final moment. The chance will not come again. I dwell on this because history and civilization have given men and women and children few moments of such gravity and fatefulness which they can share, knowing as they share it a good deal of what is at stake. History has reached many turning points, but the drama hasn't ever played before to so vast a gallery as the one you and I are sitting in nor have men ever laid their hands on such powers of destruction. Some students of political systems will tell you that fascism is a dynamic force that must expand or it wrecks itself, and that growth is its only life. And such students will not believe that any peace that would come now would be more than a truce. Writers in France, for instance, discussing the possibility of peace, are saying that if it is made today, 
Germany will have time to develop the resources and equipment of the Soviet Union so as to be prepared for a new advance later on. But the Hitler speech is expected to say that Germany now has enough, that the so-called iniquities of Versailles have been corrected, all but the colonial question, and that Europe now can have a durable peace on the foundation of its new frontiers. We've already had newspaper conjectures about the concrete proposals to be made by Herr Hitler. One is of a plan for disarmament. One is a proposal for mutual assistance pacts and the guarantee of the great powers to secure the new frontiers. These reports have come from Paris and London. Now they come from Berlin, not with an official stamp, but from sources close to the Nazi leadership. Hitler, it is predicted, will go back to his proposals made to the disarmament conference before Germany withdrew from the League of Nations. These, it is forecast, will be like the Hoover proposals, later adopted by Roosevelt, for the abolition of offensive weapons, such as heavy artillery, tanks, and airplanes. It also is predicted that Hitler will demand the removal of trade restrictions. And these Berlin sources say that not only will an ethnic Poland be set up, but that readjustments will be promised in the status of the Czechs in Moravia and Bohemia. If there is to be peace, one which Britain and France can discuss, these are among the right topics to talk about. The speech itself will disclose whether the right words about these topics is being said. The Allies will hardly make peace unless their chief aims are satisfied, and these are the restoration of Poland and Czechoslovakia and the end of Hitlerism. By Hitlerism, the statesmen of London and Paris have made it clear that they don't mean the political or economic organization of the German state. But the repetition of crises and the conquest of little countries by the modern techniques of aggression. And, say the Allies, they refuse to accept Hitler's word for anything. If Hitler offers to set up an independent Poland and to change the status of the Czechs, he is deliberately trying to say something that sounds like an approach to the Allied objective in these two particulars. If he offers disarmament, that sounds like the basis for ending aggression. And if he proposes guarantees by other countries, through mutual assistance pacts or otherwise, that sounds as though the Allies weren't having to take his word for anything. This is certain about the speech it will last long enough to measure up to the gravity of the occasion. Probably its delivery will take an hour and three quarters. Anyone who has heard Hitler speak often knows that he makes more or less the same speech every time. He soon plunges into the bitter waters of Versailles. He develops the thesis of an oppressed Germany. And in this part of his speeches, he indulges in the most extensive of the polemics which are dear to German orators. Each time that he has spoken at length in the last year's, year or two, he's repeated this speech and then drawn the special conclusion from it that the occasion demanded. A year ago, it was the Sudetenland that he had to have and the regime of Benish had to be humbled. Last spring, he had to have Danzig in a corridor through the corridor. And finally, in August, the stubborn Poles, counting on their pledge of British and French help, had to be rendered incapable of mistreating German minorities and threatening German peace. After Hitler occupied the demilitarized Rhineland, after he took Austria, after he got the Sudetenland, after he occupied the Mamerland, Hitler gave always the self-same promise. This was the last territory that he wanted in Europe. And he always said it simply and straightforwardly as though with a sigh of relief. And he's sure to make the promise again. But this time he will buttress the promise, so we are told, with talk of disarmament and perhaps of guarantees other than his own. Herr Hitler will be addressing several audiences when he speaks. The one before him will be the Reichstag, which really doesn't count except that it will break forth in deafening cheers at all the right moments. 
It's well to bear in mind that Hitler never speaks at the microphone without the background of a frenzied audience. He never tries to talk quietly and persuasively to an individual listener. He talks to crowds who must give a crowd's response. This is an essential of the totalitarian leadership. Hitler's most important audience will be the German people. For if, as he may fear, there is to be no peace, he must convince every German who has ears to hear that it isn't his, Hitler's, fault, but the fault of the British and French who want to destroy the German nation. And the third most important audience is the British and French leaders and their people. They have to be so impressed that they say even against their preconceived ideas, well, perhaps these proposals might be whipped into some sort of shape. And finally, he will be talking to the non-belligerent peoples, which means Americans and Belgians, Dutch, Swiss, Italians, Russians, Scandinavians, Spaniards, the people who aren't in the war now, but who might help decide its outcome later on, either by their economic or military action. All these neutrals must see that Germany has a case. We can take it for granted that two of the four audiences will be won over heart and soul, the Reichstag and most of the German people. As to Britain and France, it is true that they are determined not to be impressed by whatever it is that Hitler has to say. They don't believe him. They've heard him before. They've listened to him make promise after promise, sign pact after pact, and then, at his convenience, tear them up. They expect a lot of bigger and better promising this time, but they're going to meet it with bigger and better disbelieving. What British and French leaders will look for is to see whether there is, in what Hitler says, the possibility of bringing in other countries who will join them in preventing another of Hitler's breaches of promise. Lloyd George has extracted from Chamberlain a pledge to examine any peace proposal most carefully. Lloyd George, he says himself, wouldn't turn down Russian and Italian cooperation in maintaining peace. The Soviet Union can be expected to think favorably of Hitler's speech. The peace offensive really got underway in Moscow when Molotov and von Ribbentrop publicly promised to consult as to further measures if the war has to continue. Italy will be for peace if it can possibly be restored. But Mussolini apparently has washed his hands of the present proposals. We are told by Leland Stowe in a London cable to the Chicago Daily News that Italy and Germany aren't on good speaking terms, and that Count Ciano, when he last visited Herr Hitler at Berlin, told him flatly that the Rome-Berlin axis exists no more, and that it was broken by the Nazis when they signed their non-aggression pact with the men in the Kremlin. But there's no more sense in trying to forecast the effects of the speech than it is to foresee what it will say. All that can be truthfully said is that Adolf Hitler, a single mortal man, will stand before the world and out of his lungs and throat and mind will produce words and ideas that will take Western civilization to its next great turning on the road to the unknown future. I've only a moment more and must use it to record that Latvia now has signed its mutual assistance pact with the Soviet Union. By its terms, the Soviet Union gets two more Baltic ports for naval uses, and Latvia gets the security of having no more say over its external affairs. It's safe and sound within the paralyzing arms of the Russian bear. And Lithuania has agreed to cede any claims it has to the city of Vilna. Once more, power has triumphed over the claims of a little nation. And this is the last news preceding the Hitler's promise of a new Europe. Good night.